We are um, in Ezekiel still, uh, chapter um, 17, and uh, <clears throat> verses uh, 10 through 16, if you remember, because we've, we've read these a few times. And uh, what it's about is that the, <clears throat> the Lord is upset with the king of Judah at the time because he had made a covenant, uh, as it were, with God that he, you know, a covenant was made, not necessarily with God, but, uh, but certainly God saw it as that. And he had made a covenant that he would not resist the king of Babylon <clears throat> and the, the rule, as it were, of Babylon. And then he broke that. <clears throat> and the Lord was very angry because he not only broke it, but he broke it because he went to Egypt and talked to them about being a helper, uh, bringing all of Pharaoh's armies and everything else, and, and they had had a history, some good, some bad. <clears throat> um, and, um, and Pharaoh had said something about, okay, well, we'll, we'll help you. Um, so the Lord's upset with that, and um, I'm just looking over the scriptures. And, and he said... Um, um, that the Lord said that he had done that so that he could bring them down, as it were, uh, make them more humble and open to more like the way that the Lord's heart is instead of like all of the beast kingdoms around them. And um, so... Um, because of that, the Lord says in verse 16, As I live, saith the Lord, meaning, and that's Adonai, the Lord God, <clears throat> surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he break, even with him uh, in the midst of Babylon he shall die. <clears throat> All right, so the next verse, uh, the next two verses spell out that, uh, you know, probably... I'm sorry, 17, and we're in verse uh, 17, actually. Does, does uh, es not Esther. Ezekiel 17, 17, start with the word neither, if you have a King James. All right. So we, got, we have the corridor here, and um, you, know, you know the chart. The corridor of sufferings. We have the evildoers over here, and uh, and they're very big-headed, and they have little tiny horns, and they're the evildoers. And in this case, it's Babylon. And in this case, um, they look like the evildoer when, in fact, God's using it. And again, it's been His hand. The first portion of the corridor, we've recently sort of named it uh, the Valley of Decision, the Valley of Decision. The middle portion is where the heat comes, where you make that decision. Because if in this Valley of Decision, you can either come in here and you can be, be with the Lord and proceed on into it in a right spirit, in the spirit of the Lamb, or you can flee out of it. And you can flee out of it because if you had a helper over here, that helper would come and tell you, well, what you need to do is, you know, you, you should fight back, or, you know, you should, it's always something other than the nature of the Lamb. It's always something other than the nature of the Lamb. Um, very few counselors, very, very few Lamb counselors, very few Lamb counselors. Um, and so, um, uh, but if 
your heart is set on glorifying the Father through the Lamb, and that's the nature of Christ within you, the life of Christ within you, then you will proceed in the right spirit and go into the, the hot portion, you know, the fiery furnace portion. And then the last part is where the glory begins to be revealed <clears throat> once everything has been done in order. And, and honestly, I'm going to tell you, and maybe people still don't see this, but First Peter is just full of this. But, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't say it in the way that we want it to. It sounds simple, but it's not simple. It is the truth. Okay, <clears throat> so in verse 17, God addresses, or not God, remember it was Adonai who spoke last in verse 16. Okay, Adonai, the one who will get us through this corridor. Adonai, the one who will help us in maintain, uh, gaining and maintaining the spirit of the Lamb and, and the nature of the Lamb to glorify the Father through the, the Son in that manner. And um, uh, Adonai says in verse 17, neither shall Pharaoh, meaning, he, see, God's not upset right now with the evildoers because the evildoer is his hand. He's upset with this helper over here and and that's pharaoh and egypt neither shall pharaoh with his uh, mighty armory uh, armor sorry army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounds and building force to cut off many persons seeing he despised the oath talking about now the lord's referring uh to the king that broke it despised the oath by breaking the covenant when lo he had given his hand to Pharaoh, and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. Okay, so uh, it is important, and one of the things we really want to deal with tonight, in, if, if the Lord wills, we want to see how, uh, of all of the threatening, if you will, that could be seen in this picture, uh, meaning the, the fiery furnace portion, meaning the heat of the thing where it really has to be Christ um, or the evildoers or anything else. The big deal to God is these helpers that keep jumping in and trying to um, fix everything and, you know, uh, comfort you and tell you things that, you know, well, you don't have to listen to them, or, well, I know somebody that'll da-da-da-da, and all this kind of stuff. Let me tell you, you're better off not even ever hearing any of that, so your soul isn't pulled into that. You know? It's just better to, to stay with the Lord, period. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> Uh, hath done all these things, and he shall not escape. Okay, so um, uh, my notes. This, so this verse adds in another important factor. It is that not just the person who asks for outside help toward deliverance while in the sufferings of Christ are culpable, meaning that Israel or Judah, uh, they are in trouble because they went against their Adonai who was going to help them in the, to, to have the spirit of the Lamb formed in them and to manifest through them. Um, but that's, that's not the only problem here. And is, um, it is that not just the person who asked, like the king of Judah, asked for Pharaoh to come help, so naughty, naughty king of Judah, shame on you. But the person who comes and becomes the helper is even seen worse. Let me tell you, in this scenario that we've seen over and over, we've seen it in Jeremiah, we've seen it in, in um, uh, Isaiah, we've seen it in um, First Peter. We, truthfully, I've been sharing this for years, but just not with this chart, um, the worst person in here is not even the king that is rebellious against Adonai. It's the helper. 
Isn't that crazy? But it's not crazy to him, and we'll see why. <clears throat> um, um, it is that not just the person who asks for outside help toward deliverance while in the sufferings of Christ are culpable, but so is the person who compassionately comes to the rescue. He is violating one of God's most sacred endeavors, which is our release of the Lamb while in crisis. That's, so, so you see how that, to God, how bad that looks? Do you think God would have a bad reaction against that? Okay, good, because he does. <clears throat> All right, to get an understanding of this from God's point of view, consider Jesus' response. Well, let's see, should I do this one? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do this one. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I'll do this one, and then I'm going to jump into a little, I'll just, I'll, I'll present this, and then I'm going to jump into another little portion to help solidify something, and then we're really going to go over this. So I would love to finish this tonight, and this is the one that I've been telling you about that is mind-blowing when you see it the way it is. Okay, so, so you, you know what we've been talking about so far. Uh, he is violating one of God's most sacred endeavors, which is the release of the Lamb while in crisis, right? To get an understanding of this from God's point of view, consider Jesus' response to Peter in Matthew 16, when Peter, the disciple, thought intervention was needed concerning avoiding the cross. Yes, this was the thing I was withholding from you when I was talking. <clears throat> All right, so now, um, let's see. Yeah, we, let's, let's read that. Uh, that's in uh, Matthew 16, starting with verse 21 through 26. Five verses here. From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Okay, so this to Jesus isn't just warning them that there's bad people going to kill him. This is Jesus talking about the corridor and about going into it. Okay? Um, verse 22, then Peter... Then Peter? Should, should that follow Jesus' dedication and embracing of the sufferings? <clears throat> then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, unto his disciples, this is a turn from Peter to his disciples. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life, and this is his soul life. Y'all remember that? That's the word life there is the soul. The sal needing the salvation of the soul. <clears throat> Um, will lose his life for my sake, shall find it. Lose his soul life, not his existence. Verse 26, For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? All right. So I wrote in verse 21, Jesus entering the corridor of sufferings. That's him saying, I must go to Jerusalem. I must face all this stuff. The very next verse, verse 22, a helper comes to the rescue. Peter. Verse 23, Jesus' view of a helper. He's from Satan. He's an offense to Jesus. And he savors man's way, not God's way. All right. So let's go back to, I mean, we can go back to Jeremiah. We're going to go back to, to uh, Ezekiel. We could go to Isaiah. 
uh, we can go all the way through the book of 1 Peter, and we will find this same pattern over and over and over. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, so the Valley of Decision, which I have mentioned this first part, the, the, the corridor is in three parts, and the first part is where you kind of get in there and if you're going to, you know, you might wait a while, you might seem spiritual for a while, but then you start freaking out because it gets hotter, you know, seven times hotter, and you want to you wanna call for a helper, or a helper knocks on your door, you know. And um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, where, did, where is it? Um, the Valley of Decision is where we trust Adonai, or we listen to helpers, right here, this first portion. All right, or and not necessarily listen to them, but go go hunt them down if necessary. All right. So I want to read. I'd like to read the whole thing I have in here out of the book of Joel, but I want to I want to uh, I want to present um, the the definition of what's going on in the Valley of Decision. Uh, and what's going on is the dividing of evildoers and carnal helpers like Peter from lambs. Okay? That's what's going on. That dividing. All right. And um, <clears throat> so this is Joel 3. And um, basically, this chapter is God speaking to the heathen or God speaking to Tyre and Sidon and, and the Gentiles and, and the heathen. All those words are used in here and it's, and it's him saying, and they're, they're you know, they're um, part and parcel of both um, evildoer and helpers, but not true helpers because the only helper, folks, is Adonai. Okay, and that's, that's a fact. The only true helper in this situation is Adonai. All right, so um, just read in verse 4. Yea, and what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon? Okay, what have you to do with me? Nothing, okay. Um, <clears throat> and all the coasts of Palestine. All right, these are all people that are not his people. They're not his lambs, Okay. So let's uh, jump down. Like I said, I don't, I wanna, I don't wanna lose what we had in the other point, but I wanna make sure we understand this. Uh, verse eight, and I will sell your son, let's see, uh, yeah, verse eight. Now let's do verse nine. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Okay, so this is what's being prepared, the, saying to the Gentiles, go ahead, Arm yourself, go ahead, be, be beast, go ahead. But what's going to happen is, I, this is God speaking, I'm going to use this to do something amazing. Just like he used Babylon and like he used Assyria. And in every case, it's the same, same story. All right, so, <clears throat> he, so here's what he tells them. Prepare war. He's telling the Gentiles to prepare, prepare your war against his people. All right? Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Here we go. Are you ready? Let the weak say, I am strong. Anybody ever sang that song before? This is spoken to the heathen to get strong, get stronger, get stronger. Show what you are. Show you're a beast. Show you use weapons. Show you. Okay. Um, uh, verse 11. Assemble yourselves. The very thing that this, this very chapter said not to do uh, in Ezekiel. Um, assemble yourselves and come Come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither. Cause thy mighty ones, 
to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So this is the evildoers coming down. And everybody's in the valley of decision. Are you going to go with the lamb? Are you going to just see this as the devil or everything's just a bad circumstance or people, somebody's, being, somebody's just mean and they're being mean to me or, you know, what's, you, you gonna, you know what, you're going to make your vote. You're going to make your decision right there. You're going to vote for what you believe in. You're going to vote, you, you're going to make that decision according to the understanding that you had. <clears throat> Now, very quickly, a shorter version. Uh, I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3 through 5. <clears throat> this is also found in Micah 4. Same wording. <clears throat> and many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. This is talking about someone going into the corridor, into the sufferings, and doing it right, having the right spirit, okay? He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Just the opposite of what we read in Joel. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Folks. This is the light of the Lord. This is it. This is it. You, when you get in these situations, you're either going to walk in the light of the world or in the Lord. <clears throat> All right, so I wrote down, um, uh, in that quarter, lambs equal a right spirit. And evildoers, in this case, I'm going to call those priests. That's what they were for Jesus. <clears throat> they can be Babylon. It can be anybody that we've already discussed throughout the Bible. Um, evildoers, priests, Jesus' attitude. What is Jesus' attitude towards evildoers? Okay. Jesus' attitude. Jesus' attitude. Don't rail back. Don't justify. Don't call help, helpers. Submit. Okay. <clears throat> That's what he wants in us. All right. Now. The helpers, remember the evildoers were priests, so the, so the helper is Peter. Jesus' attitude toward, toward helpers, rebuked for intruding into the place of Adonai, the highest place within this whole corridor thing, the unseen God that is there throughout the whole thing. <clears throat> they are rebuked uh, in, uh, for intruding into the place of Adonai, which is high treason. It's worse than just being an evildoer or a, or a helper. I mean, not, but not really because God is still dealing with those people. He's still dealing with you. He's still dealing with me. If we fail in the quarter, that's not the end of it. You know, I've often said I love God's test because, you know, if you if you fail it, you can get back up again and he can, he can help you, you know. All right. Um, and rebuke for stopping God's most sacred work of letting us participate by giving him the lamb. And that's Adonai's gift too 
to the Father and to the Son. If, if, the, if Adonai, in this case, is the Spirit, it's his gift worked into us that the Father and the Son would be united in that Spirit. <clears throat> All right, so... Um, so back to Matthew 16 now. And I think we might, well, we'll see. <clears throat> so I'm going to read it again real quickly from, this is uh, Matthew 16, verse 21 through 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem. This is something he must do. This isn't, you know, you wouldn't say, well, the evildoers are doing this. Well, the evil evildoers did do it, but he chose. Let me, I don't, I hate going off on anything because it's just going to slow things down. But, but we have to understand the difference between willing weakness and just weakness. You know, we can, you can be weak because you're sick. You can be weak because you have a, 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 a handicap. You can be weak because your constitution is weak. You can be weak-minded. None of that is willing weakness, and it's not even aimed in the right direction. Willing weakness has nothing to do with human weakness. It has everything to do with Christ, the Lamb of God, being formed in us and as such chooses when it has all power, like Jesus, all, having all power, having, having 10,000 angels, he chose willing weakness so that he would enter into this corridor. I mean, we can walk around all day and say, well, you know, I got bad teeth or something, and, I, I, and you know, I get headaches, and then I... Just ask God to heal you or whatever. I mean, that's not the issue. That, don't call that this, for God's sake. Don't, don't, don't violate the truth in, the, in trying to make our personal weaknesses what this is all about. This is about accepting by the nature of Christ within us to go through that when we might have 10 different ways we could have thrown it back in the enemy's face and won but we choose to be with the Father in this, to give him his son and his nature and glorify God. And then the glory that shall be revealed, including us at the end of that. So I hope that clear, clarifies it a little bit because it's just so not any of that stuff. It's just not, it's one thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, a choice by lamb within you to go into weakness by not using your forces and resources and letting what will be will be. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So, um, uh, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And uh, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. And I'm telling you, that is the helper of helpers right there. Um, but he turned, Jesus turned and said unto Peter, get, the, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. If, if, if Jesus was, if this was just a circumstance that was getting out of control or whatever, Jesus would have said, man, Peter, thanks for caring. Thanks for thinking about me like this. Thanks for standing up for me. But this was the corridor. This was the corridor of sufferings, and Jesus has chosen it, and he's chosen weakness, and Peter's saying, no, strength, strength. No, this is not going to be to you. No, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and literally rebuking Jesus for his own mind and his own nature. So <clears throat> then Jesus says that, you know, you're an offense to me uh, and uh, you savor the things that be of man. Okay, well, that should be pretty clear. 
No, nobody, not us, not anywhere, not in Christianity, not anywhere is there people that just go, oh, good, I'd like to just go into sufferings. This isn't about just saying I want to go into sufferings. This is not about being open to sufferings. This is about wanting the Lamb of God, the nature of Christ, the crucified one, to go through that in a right spirit that doesn't uh, justify, that doesn't go get helpers that are not of God, even though they're very kind, like Peter, and they mean well, but it's not, it's not the Lord. It's worse than not the Lord in this certain sense of what I'm saying. Um, so, so Jesus is, is saying these things to Peter strongly, strongly, well, if you just think of them walking for three and a half years and then Jesus just saying this out of the blue, you go, yeah, it's kind of about a number, number nine on the old tension scale there, wasn't it, Jesus? You didn't. But if you see it in light of this and Jesus going, I must, I have chosen, I must go to Jerusalem and go through this. And I'm with him. Can you see somebody totally with the, the Lord, totally with the Father, and totally there in this spirit and ready to step into that, um, knowing that that's going to release a, a power that you can't even imagine to touch other lives and, and all kind of stuff. So, and then somebody comes up and goes, you know, you know, oh, no, don't do this. Oh, no. Starts petting your flesh and everything. And you're going, you know, get away from me. You're, you're, you know, this, you're so opposite right now. You, you're savoring what I would want if I was in the flesh. And I would go, yeah, you're right. Get me out of this. And this isn't right. And this is unfair and all that kind of stuff. Um, then, you know, you can begin to see Jesus is saying, man, don't bug the ev evildoers. Let's get the helpers out of here. Wow. All right. Then Jesus, talking to Peter that way, you know, get behind me, Satan. You, you don't savor my Father and the Spirit and my things. You savor your things. And that all came out of that mindset and that savoring. And then he turns to the rest of the disciples and says, if any man will come after me, this is the same, same scenario, folks. This is all written one after another. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man's going to come after me in this way, meaning let him deny himself. Does this sound right? You got to do that in this corridor. <laughs> Peter, you savor the things of being me. Guys, if any of you are going to come after me, you're going to have to go through the same thing and you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to take up the cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his soul, if you're going to save your soul, instead of letting Adonai save your soul from all of that, self-protection and lying and whatever else you have to do. If, you, if any man, for whosoever will save his soul life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his soul for my sake shall find it. And the losing of your soul isn't that you don't have a soul anymore. It's that your soul is not in charge. It's not telling you what to do, when to do, and, and feeding off of, of the knowledge of good and evil and feeding off of the things that man savors of. No. I will be one with this lamb. I will let him live out of me. It will, his spirit will manifest in this earthen vessel. For the time being, I will bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus in this situation that the life also of Jesus may come forth so that death would work in me, but life in you. In the verses following his rebuke of Peter, Jesus is strictly using the phrase of taking up the cross 
in reference to all of us yielding willing weakness to God when under the trials of the sufferings of Christ. Okay? So the phrase, taking up your cross. Okay. Now, how many <laughs> definitions have we ever heard of taking up the cross? You know, the first one I ever heard was, well, well, my old grandmommy is sick and I can't come to your church. You know, and I said, why is that? He said, well, I'm just, I'm just bearing my cross. I said, your old grandmommy is, a, <laughs> is the cross <laughs> that you're bearing? You know, that wasn't, that wasn't it. You know, and so we say, well, it's this or that, or, you know, um, uh, we, we put it in terms of discipleship, but this context is not discipleship. Read it. Study it. It's not. It is not. Jesus is speaking the things of the, the cross out from this reality that he's about to go into, and he won't have any of your ideas of trying to help me get out of this. And when he talks about it, just like in, in uh, 1 Peter, he's talking about your soul needs to be saved, Peter. If any man come after me and, you know, he doesn't lose that soul life that's pressing itself and its demands and its fears and all this kind of stuff, if it doesn't, you know, but you're going to have to deny all of that, okay? So, um, You know, even, even saying all of this, even to me seeing it so clearly, someone can refute that and say, well, well, it's not that or whatever, you know. And I probably, I don't have a problem with somebody disagreeing with me. Everybody doesn't have to see everything I see the way I see it. I, I don't, I, I particularly hope you don't. <laughs> I'm still growing and learning. But, but uh, I'll never change on this. Because to me, the Spirit of God jumped on me and said, go over to Matthew 26 and said, I want to show you how real this is. This isn't some thing that's going to maybe come along once in your life and it'll be five minutes. This is going to be the valley of decision that you'll enter into first. And you're either going to take those, those uh, plowshares and beat them into weapons? Or you're going to take the weapons and beat them into plowshares so that the seed can come up. So that the seed can come up. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, so in Matthew 16, 21, Jesus declares that he chooses embracing willing weakness. And that's what he's doing. He's chosen willing weakness. He's already chosen. I, I must go to Jerusalem and have all this terrible stuff happen. I've already chosen this. Jesus declares that he chooses embracing willing weakness, not just to pass through sufferings, but through sufferings all the way to death. In verse 22, we have Peter stepping in as a helper. In verse 23, we have Jesus' stern response to helpers. But Jesus' act of embracing willing weakness is turned by him to be understood by his followers to be something they too must embrace and pass through. He defines it as taking up your cross. All right, so, so I can go a little further here. Um, you, you don't know how long I've been sitting on this thing. <laughs> I've been ready to explode several different times, uh, but I knew that this could be, for all of us, a defining moment to truly have it spirit breathed and I've been praying for you 
that the Spirit would breathe this so that there would be no question in your mind that Jesus is doing exactly what Peter, 1 Peter was talking about. And, and why would Peter be talking about this? Because he got rebuked over it. <laughs> he didn't want to be a helper. He wanted to go into it. And so he declares it over and over. And then he declares Jesus being our example. You too need to... See? So, um, so we're going to go back to Ezekiel here, and um, I don't guess I'm ever going to finish this chapter. It's been a good chapter, though, hasn't it? <laughs> and, and it starts with this parable that nobody can figure out. <laughs> it's really funny. <clears throat> Verse 19. Ezekiel 17, 19. <clears throat> Therefore thus saith the Lord, which is who? Adonai, the Lord God. As I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised, and my covenant that he hath broken, even it will, it will I recompense upon his own head. And I will spread my net upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon. So, so God is saying, you know, if you just had a been with me in the corridor, in the valley of decision, if you had only chosen, just stay in this and do, don't fight back and do it in the right spirit and don't call any helpers. Y'all know this because we've read it in all three books, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and, and here. And, and he's saying, but because you, you know, you broke my oath and you despised it and you despised my covenant, then I've got, I'm going to recompense this on your head. I had promised you in my oath to you and you received it that if you didn't fight back I wouldn't remove you from Israel and Jerusalem but you did you're rebellious people that's what he called them and so now he says therefore you know I'm going to I will spread my net upon you and you shall be taken in my snare and I will bring you into Babylon but listen to this, and will plead with him there. But it's not just, not just, please come to me. It is, I will plead with him there for his trespass that he hath trespassed, get ready, against me. This is Adonai speaking. Oh my God, do you get it? My Lord, do you get it? You, I Adonai is saying, you usurped my people, my authority, my, my way, my light. Remember, walk in this light. You've, you've usurped this. You've, you've been, you acted as the king. Because you, and they didn't, you know, partially they didn't understand all this stuff, but it had been explained to them, you know, we say, well, they didn't understand. <laughs> okay, well, if you don't understand it, go after God with all your heart. Amen? And then verse 21, and all his fugitives with all his bands shall fall by the sword, and they that remain shall be scattered toward all winds, and ye shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it. <clears throat> All right, so uh, is, that, is that clock pretty much right, or do we know? What time is it? Okay, then I'm going to read this little part here and see if I can't finish this scripture out. <clears throat> Throughout this chapter, Adonai continues to be that part of Elohim that is addressing and overseeing this situation. 
Clearly, verse 19 is again referring to Judah and its king. Here, once more, Adonai refers to the breaking of the oath. And, and as them despising and breaking his covenant. See, we say, well, I, I wasn't a covenant. I just, I just, you know, I just said I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't fight against Babylon. We have, we have to relate to God on God's basis. I know most of Christianity doesn't do that. They relate to God on their basis. But we have to find out what his basis is. And if he calls that a covenant, we need to know it. And we can't go, I didn't know, don't send me to Babylon. He's going, no. You know. He didn't, you know. I mean, every, you know, the ones that went to Babylon, God eventually opened the door where they could come back. Not all came back. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I mean, really, what can you do? Well, nothing. God gave us free will. Um, because God had viewed it that way as a covenant, therefore he states that he, as Adonai, will recompense this violation toward himself. Is it possible that so much of our attempts to get out of certain things is really us standing against our Adonai? Could that be? You know, like I said, not everything's the devil. Not everything's just mean people. Not everything's, <clears throat> you know, bad luck or whatever. I don't even know, uh, you know. Um, is it possible so much of our attempts to get out of certain things is really us standing against our Adonai? The Lord refers to the king's soldiers as fugitives, meaning... They are running from God's chosen approach to the situation. Okay. All right, so let me find. I'm so happy to have shared this tonight with y'all. You don't know. Little Randy's heart was been busting for a long time. <laughs> it has. It's to me. It's just so precious and sobering, but definitely precious. Okay, I'll do that. All right, we're going to pray, and then at 8 o'clock, <clears throat> we're going to come back. Well, not us, but a whole nother group of people. Not really. Uh, and we're going to go through um, the, what's the name of the class? <laughs> yeah. So you're afraid of the devil in the end times. And it, this one's going to be fun. So hopefully those of you who want to be, it's short. This one will be a little longer than the others, but it's, it's, uh, it's short compared to our long type stuff. Father, bless us with your spirit, your Adonai, to work on us, to bring us into this, this spirit of the Lamb, this spirit of Christ, the spirit of Christ crucified. Let this mind be in us that is also in Christ Jesus, Father. I just ask you to continue to, through innumerable proofs, bring us to a realization that this is a huge issue throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. In Jesus' name. Amen.